Hello, it's David. Now this is my STE and if you've been uh, following any of my videos about the STE you'll have seen uh, this big stack down here which is PyStorm in this case but before that it was my DSTB1 and all the things that they've had in common has been this Exos uh, CPU adapter down here. Now I've shown this before uh, but here it is in detail. I've just put a, a standard 68,000 here and this will work absolutely fine. The STE has a PLCC 68 socket on it, uh, which uh, normally obviously houses a PLCC 68, 68,000 chip, uh, whereas the STFM, Mega ST, uh, and a lot of accelerators are built for the DIP 64 package, um, 68,000 CPU that you see here. And what this does is it just translates from there to there. I say just because actually um, that's a pretty tricky operation. You've got a socket like that and it takes a little bit of, um, of cunning to come up with a way of getting something into there that resembles a PLCC 68 chip. The way uh, this uh, Exos Alpha board does it is uh, that it has a series of 1.27 millimeter pins soldered in and a big 3D printed uh, backing plate to hold them at the appropriate distance. Now that's great and it does work beautifully as we've seen. This particular adapter also has uh, these pull-up resistors around here to, uh, to help stabilize uh, the bus. Um, if you have a look at my previous video linked up here, about the uh, stabilizing the bus on the uh, SCFM. I, I explain why that, that is helpful when you start adding accelerators to boards. This is great, but uh, this was intended for the, uh, the Terrible Fire 536 board uh, to rotate it around 90 degrees and get it to fit nicely in the SCE's form factor. But unfortunately uh, for, um, I'm not going to clip that in now, unfortunately for uh, general generic accelerators it's not so splendid as whilst it uh, does fit in here between where the disk drive would go which is up here and uh, and obviously um, the uh, CPU socket itself it doesn't allow once you start stacking things up the keyboard to fit at all if we come down to this angle you'll see that actually already with just the CPU in it there's no way that the keyboard will uh, will slot into its uh, uh, slot into its position here, laying against this and laying against this. That actually, well, okay, I haven't got it all the way in, but uh, maybe I can clip it in. There we go. That actually intersects there. So you can never have the lid on with this in place unless you have something that's soldered completely flat. So my plan is to have a go at building myself uh, one of these. Um, so I've only got one and uh, I think it's just worth learning uh, how to build one in the first place. But also what I'd like to do is maybe turn it around 90 degrees, something like that, to allow the keyboard to fit in place. If that were to, uh, to, get, to fit in like that, for example, I think the keyboard would fit. Now, I suspect that once I start stacking up my accelerator cards, I mean, I mean certainly that Raspberry Pi would never fit, but even my DSTV1, I think, would be hard-pressed to, uh, to make clearance there because it's got another uh, layer on it still. See, there's the DSTV1, and that, that is quite a stack. I mean, even if you take off these two debugging pins, that is quite a stack. Um, I'm not going to put this in all the way now just uh, uh, because I want that for my STFM at the moment but even uh, yeah no there's you see there's no chance that that's going to that's going to fit in there with the way that the keyboard lies uh, but perhaps if we were to offset it a little bit further move it back here have uh, have it sit uh, perhaps up this in this sort of position uh, above the uh, is that the MFP above this uh, I think that's the MFP chip there have it sit above there. Perhaps that would uh, that would be sufficient. So I've uh, I've sketched out a uh, a quick cutout here on uh, a bit of cardboard, which is where I think I have clearance. So that would fit over the CPU. So I think I can take it out comfortably 
to any of these points here. Um, now, I suspect, unfortunately, because of the way that the keyboard is configured, even if I were to go all the way out to that extreme there, I don't think the keyboard would, uh, would fit with that thickness of stack on it. Um, but it might do with just the 68,000 itself. Okay, that's not particularly helpful, but this is a learning experience. I want to have a go at designing one of these PLCC 68 adapters with these little 1.27 millimeter pins, and I want to see whether I can build it reliably, and then I can start to experiment with um, perhaps a better location here uh, for a relocator board. Perhaps even what I could do is to build the, um, uh, for example, I could build the uh, DSTB1 into the relocator board. That would, uh, that would obviously take away quite a lot of layers there and allow me to fit into the chip into this position here, perhaps. One other thing we need to bear in mind that makes this um, uh, quite a difficult proposition is that on the back of the keyboard here, we actually do have some components that project down. Now obviously we've got the mouse and joystick ports which should fit into this uh, receptacle here. But then once we move towards the, um, the processor area, uh, you'll see that the uh, intelligent keyboard controller starts coming into play. And that is in a socket and that actually does have quite a big offset. Then up here we've got uh, some inductors and the actual socket for the keyboard connection itself. So once the, uh, the keyboard actually comes and sits into its slot here, I think we'll probably find that the, uh, that the paraphernalia on the back of the keyboard actually reduces our clearance even further. Now I do apologise, my lighting in here is not the best, so you may not actually see what I'm talking about here, but this is how the keyboard comes down uh, to, to sit in its bay. There we go. And that chip, the keyboard controller and the MFP there are basically separated by, and you can just see the processor socket underneath, that's separated by just more than the width of my finger there. So I'm going to say that that's uh, maybe 15 millimeters is all that we have to play with there. So I, I suspect that we'll be uh, restricted to either building something onto the board itself or just a, a single processor in there. Uh, but for development purposes, I'm willing to give that a try. Okay, so this is what I've come up with. So the 75 millimeters depth here is based on that bit of cardboard that I chopped out. Just a simple T-shape. Uh, we've got a 68,000 socket uh, across the top here. That's the, uh, the normal DIP64 socket. This is our array of 1.27 millimeter pin pitch uh, through hole pins. Um, and these are the key dimensions that I'm using. So 24.7 millimeters center to center for opposing rows and a 2.21 millimeter difference uh, between the, uh, the end of uh, one you know, lateral row and the center of the vertical row next to it. That's obviously repeated all the way around. So that's symmetrical. That's what I've come up with. And all these do is these simply pin, pin one at the bottom here. So if it's in the STE in the orientation that you're looking at it like this. And all it does is it roots all of the pins out uh, up here into the 68,000 socket. Um, I've got a couple of decoupling capacitors on the both of the power lines. This is a four layer board. So we've got power and ground rooted internally. Um, and I've just added here these uh, resistor networks for um, stabilizing uh, the bus as, uh, as we showed on the Exos card. So these are just pull up, additional pull up resistors that you can fit optionally if, the, uh, if you haven't had the modification done to the, uh, the motherboard itself. And I could have done these as SMD uh, resistor networks. That's what I've done on all my other boards. And it's, uh, to be fair, I'm perfectly comfortable with those and that's what I like. But I thought I would do these as through hole uh, resistor networks just to see whether I can fit them in, just to see whether that would work uh, equally as well. Um, and I also happen to have some of these left over. So uh, from my ST, 
FM upgrade. So I, I thought I'd just give those a go. I've slapped a couple of holes in the board here. Um, this one should have clearance. I don't think these ones will be much use. I think these ones will end up touching down on the, uh, the MFP, but I just happen to have holes in the board here. So I thought I'd, I'd put some in in case, you know, we needed some support uh, posts to be fitted basically. But there we go. So that is our board design and it's time to uh, to parcel it up and uh, ship it off to a sponsor for this video, PCB Way. I'd like to thank this video's sponsor and the supplier of my project PCBs, PCB Way. PCB Way aren't just about PCBs either, although they are extremely good at that. They also offer component assembly, CNC machining, 3D printing, and a variety of other manufacturing services. They have a number of community-focused offerings too. The Shared Project Hub is an open platform for makers to share and exchange their ideas, and the PCB Way store is a great place to pick up assembled modules. I mean, who wouldn't want a musical Tesla coil? So many thanks again to PCB Way, and I recommend you have a look at some of the links included down below. So here we are. Box has arrived all the way from the uh, the factory in Shenzhen, and uh, this is quite large from what I'm expecting. Um, oh well, better to be overpackaged and underpackaged, especially when DHL have got their hands on it. Uh, so let's uh, let's open this up and uh, have a look at uh, at our creation. Uh, just make sure there's nothing incriminating in here. Though. No, there's not, but there's a lot of other stuff. What's all this? Some goodies. Ah, little post-it note sort of notepad dispenser thing. That's always useful. Thank you for that. There's the there's the boards. Ah, ha, ha, ha. We'll get to. Oh, we've got a second batch of boards. Ah. Now look at that. That's nice. This they've clearly. There's been a mistake in production and they've lost a board or boards failed um, uh, quality assurance testing. And uh, so in, instead of shortchanging me, they've actually run another production batch. And uh, I'm supposed to have five, I think. Do I have five? That's very kind. Well, if that works, then I'll, I'll have some to give away. Fantastic. <laughs> Looks like we've got some swag. So uh, there we go. What's this? Is this the eighth birthday of PCP Way? I don't know. I've not been. Uh, I don't think I'm across this. I've got plenty of stickers. Anybody want a sticker? <laughs> That's nice. I've got a pen. PCB Way. PCB prototype the easy way. That's a rather nice pen. Actually, that's that's not staying in the shed. That's coming in with me. Uh, oh, I've got a, I've got a PCB way ruler. Look at that. That's a circuit board. I think that looks like your normal 1.6 mil. And it's got all the different footprints on it. It's got trace widths. What have we got here? We've got SMD, the various SMD footprints. Look how tiny some of those are. Uh, look at that. That's lovely. And then it's gold finish as well. Uh, yeah, up SOT 223. I know that one very well. A couple of little QFNs. Look how tiny the QFNs are. And the different wire gauges here. Look at that. Or is that? Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, look at that. There we go. We've got um, American wire gauge and metric measurements. That's nice. <laughs> this awesome ruler belongs to. Get to write my name in it like I'm at school. Look at that. All of the... Uh, QFP 100.5. That's uh, that's a frequently used one on this channel. Uh, yeah, I no, not being brave enough to do any BGA. BGA DDR3. That could be that could be useful. I should probably do that. TSOP 66. I don't think I've got TSOP 66. I've got TSOP 54. I've used a few times. I think for the memory. But look at that. That's that's very kind. Thank you, PCB Way. And um, <laughs> if it's embarrassing, you're never going to see this. It is. Ah, oh, ha, ha. <laughs> I think that's a 
a desk ornament, a PCB way. That's, I think that's 3D print. That's 3D printed. That's very fine 3D printing. Have a look at that. Can you see the? Uh, maybe it's more visible on the back here. Yeah, look at that. Can you see the the grains or the 3D prints? I think that's 3D printed. Uh, yeah, I, I suspect. I think that's a desk ornament. PCBWay desk ornament. So there we go. Well, we know that PCBWay do uh, 3D printing as uh, as well as uh, CNC machining and PCBs and and all the other all the other services, SMD assembly. So there we go, that's actually uh, that's a bit of a guide to what the 3D printing looks like. I'm afraid the black a little bit, uh, a little bit of oil on here I think. I'm afraid the black does not um, doesn't uh, really allow me to show the, uh, the structure in its best light. But uh, <laughs> Well, um, thank you for all that PCB weight. I don't think there's anything more on that. No, splendid. Right. Well, that was fun. Uh, <laughs> but that's not really what we're here for. Let's have a look at the PCBs themselves. Okay, so there's the pin one marker. Uh, That's the top side. No, that's the. Which one of it? That's the bottom side. That's the bottom side. That's the top side. Pin one marked there. Our uh, 68k socket would go in here. We've got the optional resistor networks on the bottom, a couple of capacitors, and uh, we'd have to fit in here our 1.27 millimeter pitch uh, pin headers. Okay, so I think it's time to uh, to try building this up. Uh, what I'm going to do first is to try and get the the little pin headers in, and we'll, we'll test it in a socket to make sure they're in the right place uh, before we carry on with anything else on here. The pin headers I'm using are uh, standard uh, 1.27 uh, pitch single uh, inline uh, pin headers. Um, I think this is a 20 position one. We need 17, so we'll have to break them down a bit. These are very tiny and uh, very easy to lose, so we better be gentle with them. They are very small. Yeah, well, I mean, they're half the size of uh, they're half the pitch of the uh, the normal single row ones, which uh, which look like that in comparison. But of course, half the width. Half the spacing means one quarter of the area. So the side where it's marked for the jumpers, this is uh, the uh, the downside. So the board goes in in this direction. Pin one uh, marker is on on the top. All of the uh, uh, all of the um, uh, what's the word? All of the components are mounted on the bottom. So this will sit in there like that, and you see this is a 20, a 20 row header, so we need to break uh, three off the end, and I am bloody awful at this, I'm going to be honest with you. So what I intend to do is to take actually quite a big pair of pliers, um, hold, <laughs> basically hold right up to the appropriate place. So I'm uh, providing a good, solid foundation. There we go, like that. And then I'm going to use another smaller set of pliers to snap them off. I'm not going to go in with the snips or anything silly like that. And hope that we get a clean break. There we go. So that should be, yeah, there we are, three removed from the end. And that should be, hopefully, our perfect fit 17. And they uh, poke up from the other side of the board about 
that far, which is just enough to be able to solder. Now, this next bit is actually very hard and I don't know the best way of doing it, so don't necessarily follow my advice, but I'm going to explain how I intend to do it. So how I plan to do it is to hold as far as I can on one side the pins at as close to a 90 degree angle as I, as I can and then anchor in the middle just one or two pins because say I've got it wonky, say it's like that, then I've only got to re-melt just that one pin to get it straight again. And then I'm going to just do that literally by eye uh, on all four of them uh, before we see how well it lines up with um, an actual socket. So I'm going to put a dob of um, flux around that pin one marker. That's going to be my anchoring point. Uh, where's my solder? I've got my uh, got my through hole chisel tip in place here. Going to get a blob. Big blob of solder on the end. And then this is purely going to be by eye. Uh, too much there. Uh, probably about there. I'm going to dob into the middle. I hope to anchor a pin. Right, I think I've anchored one. There we go. That's relatively solid. There we go. I'm not displeased with that. That looks, to all intents and purposes, Oh, maybe a little tiny inward lean, but you know what? I don't think that's too bad. So, now it's just a case of, well, I'll repeat that four times over. So, there we go. Uh, that's my, lovely thumbprint, that's my uh, first alignment attempt. So, let's do it that way up. I think they are relatively at relative right angles. I think that's probably pretty good. Okay, I think I can be rel relatively confident that that's going to fit. onto the DIP64 headers. Right, so the STE is out. This is the CPU uh, socket here. Uh, I've popped my uh, uh, P16 68,000 into the uh, the socket here. I still need to finish cleaning this up. I haven't got my uh, my blank template sorted out yet. We'll do that. Uh, we'll do that next. Okay, so I've got a light balance precariously here to try and show you a little bit what's going on. But the idea basically is that we try and line up the pins in one direction correctly, and then. Move them, move it back and forward until we're lined up in the other direction as well. I think I might have got it right first time. There we go. And um, can't see a thing, can you? Sorry about this. There we go. That's lined up, and you see it's rocking because it's getting pressure equally from all sides. So then, what we've got to try and do is to keep it as flat as possible and apply an even pressure. Okay, not quite even, but a nice solid positive click and there we go that's in all the way you can just see through to the back there but there is clearance electrical clearance between uh, the MFP chip and our pins not that that makes a difference because that's obviously a plastic top chip but there is clearance there so we don't need to worry too terribly much about that 
Right, so we're in, positive click, let's, um, let's see if she boots. Okay, so here we go, we've got power in, we've got the monitor in, we've got the keyboard attached, we've got a floppy hiding under there, and uh, our adapter is sat firmly in place. So uh, let's throw the switch and see what we get. Okay, I've got a green light on the monitor. There we go, perfect. Emutos has booted up. There we go. Okay, so that is all looking very appealing. That's uh, that seems to uh, that seems to be doing the job. Uh, so one, no, I'm going to power that down. So one uh, last test, which uh, was um, something that I was particularly interested in, is can the keyboard now fit in the case? And um, obviously, this is just with a sixty-eight thousand in. Okay, so there's the clearance. Now, I don't know how uh, obvious that is, but that there's only actually about a two millimeter gap between that and the intelligent keyboard controller. Okay, so there's not a lot of space um, once the keyboard's back in uh, for us to add DSTB1. That's not gonna happen. That's gonna require another approximately, I would say 10 millimeters, you know, the height of two of these plus the bit in between plus the uh, uh the circuit board so that we need another 10 millimeters it looks like there's only two millimeters uh, between that and the uh, uh the chip on the uh the ikbd chip back here on the um on the keyboard so let's turn our attention to the uh, uh the lateral space so i've remounted the original floppy uh, drive up here just to give us an idea and uh from a top-down view, you can see that, sure enough, we've judged that pretty well. We've got, what's that, maybe a three millimeter clearance. So the vertical clearance there is, uh, from the board itself, is reasonable. We could poke that under the, um, under the disk drive a little bit further. We could probably go another, I would estimate, 20 millimeters under there if we needed uh, board space and you see we're pretty much in the right place laterally uh, we wouldn't want to go any closer to that peg so that one's uh, that one's about right um, but the most obvious place that we could expand to if need be is along here uh, although when we looked at the keyboard itself that has the, the, the power connector there or the, sorry, the keyboard connector itself and a few sort of um, uh, inductors so there's not really a huge amount of space to play with if we wanted to stack vertically. We may sort of need to come right over here in front of the sims, which uh, you know may be possible to, to have something uh, stacking up here, but not really a 68,000 sized chip. So probably the best use of space when it comes to uh, an adapter like this is to actually come out laterally here, use up all of the space available here, but don't go vertically. So Perhaps, uh, you know, you could easily get a PLCC 68 chip over here, uh, you know, it for 68,000 PLC 68 chip over here, that's plenty of room. And then there's actually lots of other space for other things, but I don't think we're going to be seeing the, uh, the vertical stack approach, uh, which is common in the Amiga world, because they have a bit more space sort of over on their left-hand side. Um, and uh, also for, you know, uh, STFMs with relocators. I just don't think that there's a lot of vertical vertical um, clearance here. So turning our attention now to uh, the uh, backing plate that we we'll need to put in here to stop the uh, the pins um, uh, pinching inwards. Uh, what I had uh, tried to do in the past was to use a sort of spring-like arrangement. I've, I've got a video on this, um, one of my earlier ones. Um, where uh, I, you print print this out and it would provide a degree of outward pressure. You'd uh, pop these in here. One, uh, so you print two of these. One would go face up, one would go face down, and you squeeze them in. And we go between the pins, and the uh, the spring action would apply outward pressure. Um, and they would sort of go opposite direction like that. But unfortunately, what I found uh, certainly with PLA that I've been using here is that after only a few days uh, they would effectively take on that form permanently there's a little spring there that's rebounded but but basically that has um, 
that has molded itself into that shape and you can see that if you look at it sideways on um, you can see that the uh, it's actually sort of bowed down maybe that's not so easy to pick up on the camera but uh, yeah unfortunately PLA not spring enough for that purpose it, um, it just goes to its original shape so the technique that's been adopted uh, with the exhaust board is to have a blanking um, uh, plate like this, basically um, full fill um, 3D print. Uh, but my, this one uh, bought from the exhaust store, they, they sell them for a pound. Um, for me, it's a little bit too tall. I think I need to shave the edges off to, to get it to fit. Uh, you see it sits on top of the black uh, plastic base there. So I'd need to shave uh, like a chamfer the edges. Um, and actually, it was a, really a struggle to get it to insert in there, and I basically had to take the Dremel out and keep shaving it down until it uh, until it worked. So I, it's only a it's only a square with a corner cut away. So here is my more recently 3D printed one. It's a little bit thinner, and I say all it is is really a square with just one corner uh, cut away, and you can print it, see if it fits and just adjust the X, Y, and Z, to a certain extent, scaling on your 3D printer until you find a nice snug fit. And the trick that I, uh, I use is to, uh, is to take your pins that you think are pretty close to aligned, and uh, let me just have a think which way would the, uh, would the notch go. So the notch would go in that sort of direction there. So you take it that's, uh, that you think is pretty well aligned and you try to slot it in. That one's going in quite, quite well. This one has worked beautifully first time. Look at that. That is that's actually quite impressive. I haven't had to redo that at all. Push that all the way down. It doesn't matter that the bottom of the pins slightly extends beyond the uh, the insert because uh, you know the bulk of the contacts at the top anyway. And all this is doing is it's stopping the whole thing from pinching inwards. So I think that's absolutely fine. There we go, and that should now just clip happily into place. So there we go, the flop is in, the adapter's in place, the keyboard's in, we're up and running. Everything's as it ought to be. And we've learned a little bit more about the spacing that we have available for our accelerators here in the STE. The main objectives I had for this build were to prove that I could make a PLCC 68 plugin, which has worked, uh, to prove that I could uh, successfully build a relocator board, which is working well, and to see how much space we actually have once we start putting things into the STE. And okay, I'm limited at the moment. I can't get my uh, DSTB1, or certainly not Plystorm in here, but we've seen where we could look to move around. I think more likely is that any accelerator that I build will have to build on a adapter itself. But now that I've proved I can do that, that should be fine. So thank you very much for watching. And I'll catch you in the next video.